Yeah, Messier 21, M21. Look at that, oh, beautiful. And unfortunately, this is M20, the Triffid Nebula, which we've already done. Oh. But it has a nearby friend down here, which is rather less inspiring looking, called Messier 21. Uh, and in fact, they were both discovered by Charles Messier on the same day. So I suspect probably he just spotted them at the same point in 1764 when he discovered the Triffid Nebula at the same day. He also found this rather less exciting looking object down there. So it's one of those uh, open cluster things, actually quite a young cluster of stars. It's probably no coincidence that it's somewhere near the Triffid Nebula because the Triffid Nebula also has a cluster of young cluster of stars that's still in the process of forming. Uh, Messier 21 is just a little bit further along the line. I think there's about 70 odd bright stars, but so probably a few hundred stars in total. Okay, so it turns out you can do some science with this object. So here's the paper from a little while ago. When was it published? 1993 this was published. The age, spread and initial mass function of the open cluster NGC 6531. Which is... Messier 21's other name. So in fact I'm just going to talk about the, the age spread and save the initial mass function for another day. But the age spread is kind of the interesting one. So I'm going to have to, I'm afraid, so if we delve into this paper, it's a very short paper, it's one of these, it's actually from a conference so it's actually quite a kind of a short paper. I have to talk about these things again, the colour magnitude diagrams or Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams which we talked out about a lot of times for clusters of stars. So basically you measure the colour of a star with blue to red along the bottom. Uh, and then the luminosity of the star from faint to bright on the axis up here. And you find that stars are not entirely randomly spread in this space. They kind of tend to cluster in particular places. So this is the kind of the raw data when you actually look at all the stars. So actually this gives a quite good indication quite how many stars there are in the cluster. And you can see there's a bit of a pattern there, but there's an awful lot of mess, you know, a lot of spread around. At least in part, that's just down to the fact that there's actually still dust in this cluster. It's sufficiently young that there's still obscuring material in the cluster. Fortunately, if you measure lots of different colours, so you measure kind of the light in lots of different bands, blue, green, red, infrared and so on, you can actually fix, separate out what the kind of the intrinsic colour of the star is from the obscuration effects. So you can kind of correct the colour and that gives us this plot over here, which you can see is everything's kind of much neater and tidier. That huge scatter has kind of gone away. But there's kind of a couple of things I wanted to talk about about this kind of cleaned up version of the colour magnitude diagram. The line drawn here is a thing called the zero age main sequence. Now that's where a, st where a star ought to be if it's just a boring star like the Sun which is just burning hydrogen to helium in its core. Th that's what the, this thing called the, the main sequence is and the zero age part implies that it's just that's where it is when it starts doing that. And you can see you know to some extent the stars do indeed lie along the zero age main sequence but there are several kind of systematic effects. Okay in fact there's probably three that maybe you can pick out you'll see that the things at the top here all lie systematically to the right of the line. You can see down here there's a big gap where there's nothing at all. And you can see over here the things lie systematically to the right of the line as well. Okay. Now it turns out those things are n not unconnected to each other. Let's start with the ones up here. The ones up here are the most massive stars, so they're the bright, brightest stars which tend to be the most massive stars. Massive stars have very short lifetimes just because even though they're, kind of, they're massive so they've got more fuel to burn, they burn it incredibly quickly so they live fast and die young. So these are the massive stars and these ones are actually already approaching the end of their life. And so they've already started to evolve off this main sequence. You can actually figure out how long ago they were on that main sequence, how long ago the cluster actually formed um, from how far they've moved and the answer is about 8 million years ago. So this tells you this cluster is about 8 million years old, which in astronomical terms is, is very recent, it's a very young cluster of stars. Okay, so you can get the age from that. So that's the end of things. Then the other end of things, actually the, both these effects are sort of connected to one another. The reason why these stars are all over here is because they haven't actually even made it to the main sequence yet. They're still kind of collapsing and forming and, and turning into normal hydrogen burning stars. One of the things that happens as a star collapses to the main sequence is it heats up, gets hotter and hotter, before it reaches the point where the hydrogen in the core starts to burn, the helium-3, one of the, the isotopes of helium that's in there, actually burns at a lower temperature. There's not very much of it, so it actually doesn't sort of do anything very much, but it does actually sort of generate some, some luminosity for a while, some heat for a while. And so what happens is the star's kind of collapsing, it kind of gets hung up at that point. Um, where it's just turning helium-3 into helium-4 for a little while. And actually that's why these, there is this gap here, that actually all these guys are kind of hung up and eventually they'll have exhausted all their helium-3 and then they'll join onto the main sequence quite quickly. But you end up with this kind of gap appearing because everything's just kind of hung up at that sort of pre-main sequence stage. And again you can actually figure out, okay, so how long, just from where this gap is, you know basically which stars are currently at this sort of hung up stage 
and you can actually use that to figure out how long these things have been forming for. And it works out that these things have been forming for about 8 million years. It's taken them about 8 million years to get this far. It's going to take them a little bit longer. Which was the same number that we got from the massive stars at the top. Which I guess at some level might not be a surprise because it's telling you basically, well, this is, means the whole thing's about 8 million years old. What's interesting about that is it tells you something fundamental about the star formation because it tells you that basically these are the low mass stars and these are the high mass stars. This is saying that they all formed at the same time. That when you form a cluster of stars, it's not like you form the low mass things long before the high mass things or the high mass things long before the low mass things. Because if that were the case, we'd have ended up with different ages for the low mass stars and the high mass stars. The fact that they all come out with the same age is kind of a rather nice piece of evidence that actually when you form a bunch of stars, the little ones and the big ones all form at more or less the same time. Because of the way this temperature scale is arranged, so this is blue, these are hot things, this is red, these are cool things, and this is bright and this is faint. So when something before a star is born, it starts out as cold and faint. Well, it's just basically not a star yet. So cold and faint is down here somewhere. Okay, and the things at the bottom kind of evolve across to here. And then these guys, kind of, they went up and then across. So they get brighter and then they get hotter. And they'll end up here. So the things follow different tracks when they're coming across. Actually, the, the guys down here probably went up and then came back down again. But basically, things follow different tracks. Everything kind of comes up and then the, the massive stars track straight across. The low mass stars come up and then they come back down again to here. So the different masses of stars follow different tracks in this, in this diagram as they approach the main sequence. And we're just catching them just at that point before they've all arrived or just after they've arrived on that main sequence. So is, that, is the main sequence the finish line? It's where a star spends most of its life, but then obviously when it runs out, so that's what it's, where it sits when it's turning hydrogen into helium in its core, which is where a star spends 90% you know, of its life. But after that, it will then turn helium into carbon and carbon into heavier things and so on, depending on how massive the star is. And so the stars will evolve off, turn into red giants, which live up here somewhere. Um, and actually these massive stars tend to shuttle backwards and forwards several times before they then blow up as a supernova. Those little ones, where will they go next? So little guys, because their lifetimes, once they arrive on the main sequence, they're, they're so pathetically faint that actually they use their fuel incredibly slowly. So they'll stay on that main sequence for 10 billion years, or actually from the kind of the lifetime of the universe. Eventually, when the universe gets old enough, they'll also evolve off and probably turn into red giant stars as well. But the really low mass things, they take forever before they reach that point. There's, there's hardly anything on the main sequence. It feels like the main sequence should be the place where most things are, but they're... In an older cluster, or an older, on an older diagram of an older object, would we see more actually on the line? We would see, so on an older cluster, these guys would all be sitting on the main sequence. So this end of the main sequence would be very well populated. There'd be a whole bunch of stars down here. These guys would have gone through their entire life and disappeared entirely as supernovae. So this end of the main sequence would be entirely unpopulated. So when you look at a colour magnitude diagram, you can pretty much tell the age of that object straight away by looking at some of those things, like, like a naked top and a well-populated... Bottom means, oh, <laughs> means okay, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. So yeah, really, I mean, you, you can really, you can read these diagrams very quickly, at least at that kind of crude level of saying this is an old cluster, this is a very young cluster. Just really because, because the stars up here have such short lifetimes, if you see any stars up here at all, it tells you it's a very young cluster. If you see no stars up here, it tells you it's a kind of middle-aged or old cluster. Under what circumstances would we see stars to the left of the main sequence, or a large number of stars? Over here? Yeah. Never, I think is the short answer. So, yeah, the, this is really where... There's a few... So, you'll find... So, white dwarf stars are these very, very hot, very small objects. So, they're hot, which means they're very blue, and they're small, which means they're quite faint, because there's not a lot of surface area to them. So, they live way down here somewhere. So, they're kind of... They're certainly to the left of where the main sequence stars are but there's not a whole lot over here. You sometimes find stars a little below the main sequence if they have very little by way of heavy elements in them. So very, you know, lots of hydrogen and helium, but nothing much heavier than that. And that's really because the heavy elements tend to absorb blue light very effectively in the atmosphere of the star. And so if you don't have those heavy elements in there, more of the blue light gets out, which kind of shifts the main sequence a little bit, but only a little bit. You don't end up with things way over here in the diagram. It shouldn't really be moving very fast. The, the sort of typical random motions within this cluster is only about a kilometre per second or so. So if the sun's going to escape from there, typically it would probably come out at a few kilometres per second. 